Number one, a doctor wants to determine the effectiveness of a new nasal spray on patients experiencing the flu. The flu patients are separated into two groups with the nasal spray uh, prescribed for only one of the groups. The results are compared. Which type of study best describes this situation? Okay, so this right here is an example of an experiment choice four. In an experiment, the researcher randomly separates the subjects into two groups and one of the groups gets whatever the condition is. In this case, it's the nasal spray and the other group does not. All right, number two. The town council wants to conduct a survey to determine if the citizens would be in favor of increased taxes to fund a new snowmobile trail to surround the perimeter of the township. Which segment of the population would provide the most unbiased response? Okay, so unbiased means really like fair. We want it to be as fair as possible. And in order to do that, you want to get the most random selection of people, the most random sample of people possible. So you don't want to look at one specific group. Okay, so if we take a look at the answer choices. Choice one, every seventh senior citizen living in the town on a fixed income. Okay, so this is a specific group. Okay, senior citizens, and they're on a fixed income. So that would create a biased and unfair response. So that one is not our answer choice. All right, choice two. Every fifth person from the town's lower taxes coalition group. So again, this is a specific group. You don't want to just ask people from one group because that creates biased results. Choice three. Every ninth person over 18 years of age walking down the center of town. Okay, this is actually, um, this is probably going to be our answer here because you're just randomly picking every ninth person over a certain age group, so 18 years and older, right? So that, that encompasses a huge range of ages, and they're just walking down the center of town. So that's probably our answer. I'm gonna not circle it yet, but every 10th person belonging to the local snow, snowmobile club. Again, this is a club. This is gonna create unfair results. So choice three is our answer. All right, number three. Which statement about data collection is most accurate? All right, so let's see. A survey about parenting styles given to every 10th student entering the library will provide unbiased results. All right, well, if you're going to survey students about parenting styles, that's probably not going to be um, too accurate, so I'm going to actually cross that one off. All right, an observational study allows a researcher to determine the cause of an outcome. All right, this is not true. The only thing that allows you to determine the cause of an outcome is an experiment, not an observational study. Okay, choice three, margin of error increases as sample size increases. All right, this is also false. Margin of error is how um, spread out, right, our sample means are from the actual population mean. So this is just telling us really how spread out our data is from the mean. Um, Basically, this is going to decrease as the sample size increases. Um, the more participants that are surveyed or looked at, um, the better, the more accurate results are going to be, the, the less spread out the results are going to be. And you know what? Think about it like this. Let me actually show you an example using the margin of error formula. Okay, so what I did was I used the margin of error formula, right? Um, two times the square root of P times Q over N. I used it twice using the same P and the same Q. The only thing I did was I used two different sample sizes. So look, when we have a smaller sample size, the margin of error is bigger than when we have a larger sample size, right? See, when the sample size went from 200 and it increased to 2,000, didn't the margin of error actually get smaller? So here, the margin of error decreases as sample size increases. I'm not sure what that A is, but okay, so this is not true. So I'm assuming choice four is true. I'm going to just check it out. A survey collected from a random sample of students in a school can be used to represent the opinions of the school population. Yep, that's a very true statement, right? They take a survey from a random sample, and that can be used to um, represent the opinions of the school population overall. So choice four is our answer.
Number four, the weight of a bag of pears at the local market averages eight pounds. So here's our average with a standard deviation of a half a pound. The weights of all the bags of pears at the market closely follow a normal distribution. Determine what percentage of bags to the nearest integer weigh less than 8.25 pounds. Okay, so we know that here we're going to be using our normal CDF formula. Okay, so because we're looking for the percentage that are going to weigh less than 8.25 pounds, less than tells us our lower bound is going to be a really small number. I mean, technically you could just use zero because I can't weigh less than zero, but I usually just do negative 9999. But if you put zero, that's fine as well. Okay, um, the upper bound is going to be 8.25. And then they tell us in the problem that the mean is 8, right? Average means mean, and the standard deviation is 0.5. Okay, so this is what you would show as the work on your paper. Okay, make sure you show this, because if the calculator is doing all the work for you, you have to have some work to go along with it. Okay, so now we're going to plug this in our calculator. All right, so in your calculator, you're going to go to second vars, right? That's what brings us to distribution, and you're going to choose choice 2 normal CDF and just plug in the information. There's our lower bound, our upper bound, the mean is 8, and the standard deviation is 0.5. And just click enter on paste. And when you do, this is what our calculator shows you. Now it does say that it wants us to determine what percentage of bags. So they want us to change it to a percent and round that to the nearest integer. All right, so if we look at this number here, we know to change to a percent, we move this decimal over twice. So it's going to come right here. Okay, so 69.1. So to the nearest integer, that would be 69%. All right, so there we go. All right, number five is, again, another normal CDF problem. So um, I kind of just outlined the important information. We have 184 students. The mean is 72.3. The standard deviation is 8.9. And they want to know how many students can be expected to re receive a score between 82 and 90. Okay, so we're going to use this formula and we're going to just fill in the information. Okay, so the because we want to receive scores between 82 and 90, the smaller number is going to be our lower bound and the bigger number is going to be our upper bound. And they tell us the mean and they tell us the standard deviation. So I just plug this in. And we're going to do this in our calculator the same exact way we did the last question. So we're gonna hit second and the VARS button, and we're going to do choice two, which is normal cumulative density function, right? And we are going to just plug in our numbers exactly like we see them. And when you're done, you can click enter on paste, and this is what we see. So I'm gonna write this down. I'm just gonna round it on my paper to 0.1145. Now, if they had said what percent, you know, we would move the decimal over twice and you could have 11.45% or whatever they issued around to, but they don't ask what percent um, or what's the probability. They want to know how many. So when you want to know how many, right, we have to basically multiply this number by the number of students in the class. So since there's 184 students in the class, I multiply this by 184, and that, I'm just gonna bring my equal sign down here. So we're not gonna do this rounded value times 184. We're gonna, in our calculator, basically use this entire value and multiply it by 184. So basically, all you're doing in your calculator is just hitting times 184. It'll take that previous answer and multiply it by 184, and you could see here that you wind up getting 21 students. All right, so there, there it is. Okay, so a study conducted in 2004 in New York City found that 212 out of 1,334 participants had hypertension. Kim ran a simulation of 100 studies based on this da data. The output of the simulation is shown in the diagram below. All right, so right here it's shown. Saying at a 95% confidence level, the proportion of New York City residents with hypertension and the margin of error are closest to what? 
Okay, so if we want to find the proportion, right? Well, we know that 212 out of 1,334 participants had hypertension. Okay, so if you divide these two numbers, that it rounds to approximately 0.16, okay? So this is our P, okay? This would be our proportion of New York City residents with hypertension. So choice one or choice two, those are going to be our answer choices, okay? Because here the proportions are not off. Here they made that the margin of error. Okay, now we're going to use our margin of error formula to determine what it's equal to. Okay, so here's our formula. So it's gonna be equal to two times. Now the proportion, right, would be our P, and we just found that to be approximately 0.16. So for P, I'm gonna replace that with 0.16. And the Q, we know, is equal to one minus P. So if I did one minus 0.16, wouldn't that be 0.84? And then the N is the sample size. And we know that there were 1,334 participants, so that is going to be our sample size. And basically, you're just going to plug this whole thing in the calculator and see what you get. And when you do, you get approximately 0.02. Okay, so that looks like choice two is going to be our answer. Okay, so number seven is going to use the margin of error formula, the same formula that we used in number six. So here it is. All right, so... They want us to find, let's say, two times. Now, P is considered the expected outcome, the proportion of successes. And because 78% said they would vote for her, 0.78 is going to be the P. Now, we know to get the Q, we just do 1 minus 0.78. So 1 minus 0.78 would be 0.22. And then N is our sample size. Now be careful. Even though there were a thousand more polls done, right? That's not the sample size. The sample size is the number of people that were surveyed. So here we surveyed 250 students, right? 250 voters. So 250 is going to be the sample size. Okay, and then all you have to do is just plug all of this into the calculator and see what you get and I am getting approximately 0 0.05, so choice two. Okay, so in number eight, they are asking for, again, the margin of error. And remember, we have two formulas for the margin of error. The margin of error is equal to two standard deviations, or the margin of error is equal to this formula that we had used in the last two examples. So you could, for this one, based on what they give us, you could use either one of these formulas. Personally, I think this first one is easier, right? If you want to figure out, like, the margin of error is equal to two standard deviations, well, this would be equal to two times. Well, look right here. They give us the standard deviation, right? The standard deviation is 0 0.035. So if you do two times 0 0.035, that's just equal to 0 0.07, which is choice four. If you decide to use this other formula right here, here, I'll do it actually up here, so I have a little more room. The margin of error would be equal to two times the square root of P, which would be 0.65, right? That's the proportion of voters that said they liked pizza. And we know Q would be 1 minus 0 0.65, so that's going to be 0 0.35. And that's going to be over our sample size, which um, it's not the number of simulations, it's the number of people. So that's going to be 200, okay? So we're going to put that over 200. And if you were to plug this into your calculator, you would also get a value that rounds to 0 0.07. So choice four is our answer. Okay, number nine. The J&B Candy Company claims that 45% of the candies it produces are blue, 30% are brown, and 25% are yellow. Each bag holds 65 candies. A simulation was run 200 times, each of sample size 65, based on the premise that 45% of the candies are blue. The results are shown below. Okay, so when I look at these results, as soon as I see this right here, 
I like to find the 95% confidence interval because we know anything within the 95% confidence interval is considered normal, right? Standard, usual. So let's first do that. Okay, so we know the 95% confidence interval is equal to the mean, right, right here, plus or minus two standard deviations. So I just took the mean and subtracted off two times this value, and I got 21.398, and I took the mean and added on two times this value, and I got 37.142. So basically, anything between this right here and this right here is considered like a normal standard answer. So let's see, Bonnie purchased a bag of J&B candies and counted 24 blue candies. What inference can be made regarding a bag of J&Bs with only 24 blue candies? Well, if you think about the number 24, 24 is within the 95% confidence interval. And it makes sense, look where 24 is. Okay, that seems like if you were to take the middle 95%, right, that would definitely fall within that. So that's a normal, that's like a standard, you know, that's fine. That's a usual number of blue candies to get. So let's read through the answer choices. The company is not meeting their uh, production standard. Well, that's not true. That's like a normal amount based on what they said, right? 45% are blue. Okay, choice two. Bonnie's bag was a rarity and the company should not be concerned. Well, Bonnie's bag was not a rarity. 24 is a usual amount to get. It's within the 95% confidence interval. Okay, choice three. The company should change their claim to 37% blue candies are produced. Okay, well, if you took 24 that Bonnie got blue candies out of the 65 that are in the bag, yes, that is equal to approximately 37%, but just because her bag, just because one bag received that, it's not saying that all of the bags should, okay? They claim that 45% of their candies are blue, and because 24 is within a normal range, right, the 95% confidence interval, this is an accurate amount. So they can't change their claim based on just this one bag. So that's not correct either. All right, choice four. Bonnie's bag is within the middle 95% of the simulated da uh, data supporting the company's claim. Okay, this is it. This is what we've been saying the whole time. So choice four is our answer. Number 10. All right, just hit pause, take a minute, reread it, make sure you understand what they're saying, and uh, then we'll talk about what they're asking. Okay, so this first part right here is saying to use the simulation results to construct a plausible interval containing the middle 95% of the data. All right, so when they're looking for the middle 95% of the data, they're just looking for you to do the mean plus and minus two standard deviations. Okay, this is called the 95% confidence interval. Now, if you look up here, right, they give us the mean and they give us a standard deviation. So all we have to do is just plug these two values in for here and here. Okay, so I just plugged in 0.651 for the mean. I plugged in 0 0.034 for standard deviation. And then you want to figure out what this number minus 2 times this number is equal to. And that's going to be the lower bound of our interval. And then you want to figure out what the mean plus two times the standard deviation is equal to, and that's the upper bound of our interval. Now make sure you always put the lower number first and the bigger number second. And then if we look over here, it does tell us to round to the nearest hundredth, so two decimal places. So this right here is rounded to the nearest hundredth. Okay, uh, second part. One year after launching the campaign, the Department of Transportation conducts a survey of 200 randomly selected city residents and finds that 122 of them drive to work. Okay, so if 122 out of 200 drive to work, let's figure out what 122 divided by 200 is, and that's going to be 0.61. Okay, so 61% of the people surveyed drive to work. Now it says, should the department conclude that the city's campaign was effective? Use statistical evidence from the simulation to explain your answer. Well, basically, this right here is the 95% confidence interval of people who were already driving to work. And when they launched the campaign, if you look at the top of the page, when they launched the campaign, they were hoping that less people would drive to work, so lower than what's in this interval. 
but doesn't 0.61 fall within this interval? So really, the campaign was not effective because this number, the percentage of people that were surveyed that still drive to work, are within the original interval. So I would say that no, they should not conclude the city's campaign was effective because 0.61 falls within the 95% confidence interval. Okay, number 11. Again, just take a minute to reread it, hit pause, and then when you're done, you can hit play again. Okay, so now in part A, they're asking us to, again, find the middle 95%, which is basically just your 95% confidence interval. So in order to do that, we want to do the mean plus or minus two standard deviations. Now, if you look at the top here, they give us the mean and they give us the standard deviation. So we're just going to plug those numbers in here and here. Okay, so here's our mean, here's our standard deviation, and when you do 0.702 minus 2 times 0.048, that gives us 0.606. And then when you do 0.702 plus 2 times 0.048, it gives you 0.798. Right, and you always want to look at what they ask you to round to. So here the nearest hundredth, and to the nearest hundredth, this is 0.61, and this rounds to 0.80. So this right here is our middle 95%. It's our 95% confidence interval. All right, Part B. The New York State Parks and Recreation Department that oversees the New York State Fair has told organizers that if they come and survey the visitors and find that 58% or less are there for the animals, they may not provide 100% funding for the fair for next year. Do the organizers have reason to worry? Okay, well, we found in this part, right, this is the 95% confidence interval. We're confident that 95% of the people um, fall within this interval that are there to see the animals. So since 58%, right, 0.58 falls with it, like outside of this interval, right, it's less than the lower bound, uh, this is not an expected outcome. We wouldn't expect this to happen. So no, the organizers do not have reason to worry. All right, so there we have it. They do not have reason to worry because 0.58 does not lie within the 95% confidence interval. Okay, so this is not an expected outcome. Okay, so just take a minute and read number 12 on your own, and then we will just talk about what they're asking for and how to go about doing it. Okay, so um, basically what we want to do is we want to figure out whether or not their wait time was normal or not. Okay, so because they're asking us to find the 95 level of confidence, basically we're find the, finding the 95% confidence interval, and if um, their wait time falls within the 95% confidence interval, then it's a normal wait time. Okay, so what I did here was they said that average, which means the mean, was 25.6 minutes. So I plugged in 25.6 for the mean. And then they tell us the standard deviation is 4.2 minutes. So I plugged in 4.2 for the standard deviation, and then remember, you always want to do the subtraction first because you always want the smaller number first. So 25.6 minus 2 times 4.2 is 17.2. And then 25.6 plus 2 times 4.2 is 34. So this is the 95% confidence interval. Okay, basically anything with this, within this interval is a normal wait time. Now if we look back up here, it says she had to wait 33 minutes before being seen. And 33 minutes is within this 95% confidence interval, so they had to wait a normal standard wait time. Okay, so I said here that their wait time of 33 minutes was not unusual because it lies within this 95% confidence interval. Okay, so same thing for the last ones. Just hit pause, take a minute, read this question just so you're familiar with what it's talking about, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so down here it says that Carlos is hoping that he has made a significant discovery using the information and the randomization test with a 95% confidence level to determine whether the mean uh, difference discovered by Carlos was of statistical significance or whether it just occurred by chance. And they want us to use calculations and explanations to support our decision. Okay, so let's look back in the question. Now, he found the mean difference in wingspans was 0.5 centimeters. So 0.5 is right here 
on our distribution chart here, right? So basically what we wanna do is we don't wanna just look at a difference of 0.5. We wanna look at a difference of 0.5 centimeters or even more extreme than that, right? 0.5 centimeters or even higher than that. So we're gonna take a look at all of these values. Okay, so if we count them up, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there's seven of these all together out of the 70 resamples that Carlos did. All right, so let's figure out what seven out of 70 is. So that would just be 0.10, right? 0.1, 10%, okay? So this, here I'll write it as 0.10, so we could see it, that's at 10%. Now remember, in order for something to be significant, right? In order for it to have statistical significance, it has to occur so infrequently that it occurs less than 5% of the time. And when I say it, I should have said a difference as extreme as 0.5 or even more extreme would have to occur less than 5% of the time. If not, it's just there's a chance of it happening, right? There's, it's a normal, usual occurrence. So here we could see that this difference or more occurred 10% of the time, okay? This right here occurs too often. So it's not a statistical significance. This difference in wingspan was just due to random sampling. It was just due to chance. Okay, so again, the mean difference of 0.5 centimeters is not of statistical significance because a difference of, and make sure, see I underline this, make sure you're saying what the difference is and then you wanna say or more extreme than it, right? 0.5 or more. And then basically, it's not of statistical significance because it occurs more than 5% of the time, right? If this occurs more than 5% of the time, it's normal, it happens. So it's not gonna create some sort of statistical significance. It's not gonna be some significant discovery. All right, so number 14, they're talking about a high school track team and um, one group was given the energy drink and the other group was not. And they wanted to see if the energy drink had a impact on the race times. Okay, so the first part, calculate the mean difference in race times, and they tell you to do group one minus group two, and then explain its meaning in the context of the problem. Okay, so when we take group one's mean and subtract groups two mean from it, we get negative 0.4. Okay, and now we have to explain what that means in the context of the problem. So basically what happened was group one finish the race, and you want to say on average, okay, this is on average, 0.4 seconds faster than group two, okay? And this negative means that, you know, they're finishing it faster, right? It's happening in less time, okay? So here we go. Group one, the energy drink group, finish the race 0.4 seconds faster. And again, it's so important to say on average. Without this, it's not correct. Um, then group two. Okay, so the second part. A simulation was conducted in which the boys' race times were re-randomized 250 times. I'm just going to underline that so we know that. The results are shown below. Okay, and the reason they do that is to decide whether the difference found from the fir first part, remember, what was it, negative 0.4, is of statistical significance. They want to see is a difference of negative 0.04, so extreme that it barely ever happens. If so, that means it's statistically significant and it would be because of the energy drink. If the difference is just a normal occurrence, it's just, you know, not be due to the energy drink. It's just based on what boys were put in which group. That's called randomization. Okay, so use the simulation to determine whether there was a significant difference in the boys' race times. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is we have to locate where this is on our table. So, I mean, if this is negative 0.6 and this is negative 0.2, negative 0.4 is gonna be right here in the middle. Now we wanna look at this value right here, negative 0.4, as well as anything more extreme than it. So in this case, since we're in the, we're on the left side of the chart, we're gonna look at anything even more negative than that. So we're gonna take a look at all of these values right here. Okay, so I, you know, estimated what I thought these were and I, had a total of 36 race times. So that's gonna be 36 out of 
this 250 times that they re-randomize it. Now, if we want to figure out what percent that is, just plug in your calculator, and I'm getting 0.144, which when we move the decimal over is 14.4%, which is high, right? In order for it to prove significance, this needs to be less than 5%, and it's not. Okay, so basically what we can say is there was not a significant difference in race times because a difference of negative 0.5 or less, right? Again, the reason I underline this is because I want to make sure we forget, we remember to say or less. Some people forget that. Um, occurs more than 5% of the time, right? It occurs 14.4% of the time. So, I mean, what that, what that tells us is that the difference in race times was not due to the energy drink. It was just due to which boys were placed in which group. So basically, it was just due to chance. All right, number 15. A school had a lot of problems with student absences and wanted to try an intervention program to see if it encouraged students to come to school more often. Um, as a trial, 20 students were split into two equal sized groups. Group one would get the new intervention, and group two, no intervention. The mean number of absences was calculated after one month for each group as shown in the table below. Okay, part A. The school's administration thinks this intervention program will help to lower the number of absences. Using information from the experimental design or the results, explain why the hypothesis of the school's administration may be incorrect. All right, well, here, you know, they only sampled, they only did this with 20 students. You really can't um, make some sort of you know, conclusion based on such a small sample size. Although you can see there was a difference in absences, right? The mean of group one who had their intervention was lower than the mean of group two. It's just, this is too small of a population to say that it was because of the intervention. Um, it could have just been, you know, due to chance, who was placed in which group. So I read the sample size was too small to conclude that the difference was due to the intervention program. Okay, part B, they want us to calculate the mean difference in the number of absences, and they specifically say to do group one minus group two. And even if they don't say that, then you would go right in the order you see it and explain its meaning in the context of the problem. Okay, so what I did here was I did the average of group one minus the average of group two, and that gave me negative 1.6. Okay, so what that means in the context of the problem is that group one, right, the group that had the um, intervention program, had, you don't say negative, you would just say 1.6 fewer absences than group two, and on average, okay? Make sure you say this, because this is their average number of absences, not total. So the group that received the intervention, group one, had 1.6 fewer absences on average than the group that did not receive the intervention, group two. Okay, so then in the final part, it says a simulation was conducted in which the number of absences were re-randomized 200 times. The results are shown below. Okay, now the reason they do that is because they want to determine if the difference that we found above, right, a difference of negative 1.6 absences was so extreme that it happened so infrequently um, that it would be because of the intervention program. So what I mean by that is, it says here, use the simulation to determine whether there was a significant difference in the number of absences. So if this difference is so extreme, right, so out of the ordinary, then the difference in absences must be because of the intervention program, not just because, you know, of chance by what students were placed in which group. Okay, so in order to do that, let's locate where negative 1.6 is on the chart. Now, negative 1.6 is right here, which actually doesn't even have a bar, but we need to look at negative 1.6 as well as anything more extreme than it, anything more negative than it. So we're going to be looking at from here to the left. And the only bar we have from there to the left is this one right here. So if this is 4, this is 2, I would say that's at a height of 1. So this is only 1 out of 200. Okay? So 1 out of 200, 1 divided by 200 is equal to 0 0.005. 
Now, if you take that decimal and move it over twice, that's not even 1%, right? Isn't that 0.5%? That's a half of a percent. So basically, this difference of negative 1.6 is, is extreme, right? It barely ever happens. The chance of that happening is so low that the, this difference must have been due to the intervention program and not just, you know, a difference due to chance based on what students are placed in what group. So here's what I wrote up. There was a significant difference in the number of absences because a difference of, and make sure you say this number or more extreme, so negative 1.6 or less, you could say or lower, however you want, occurs less than 5% of the time. It only occurred a half of a percent. So that's a very, very small percentage. Number 16, Joette is playing a carnival game. To win a prize, she has to correctly guess which of the five equally sized regions, uh, regions a spinner will land on as shown in this diagram below. Okay, she complains that the game is unfair because her favorite number two has only been spun once in 10 times she played the game. All right, the first thing they want us to do is state the proportion of twos that were spun. Okay, well, there was only one two, right, out of the 10 times it was spun, so one out of 10. All right, then it says state the theoretical probability of spinning a two. Well, in theory, right, there's one two out of these five equally spaced regions, so the probability of spinning a two would be one out of five. Okay, this two constitutes one out of the five equally spaced sections. All right, let me just kind of see what we have down here. The simulation output below shows the results of simulating 10 spins of a fair spinner repeated 100 times. Okay, so this is, well, oops, sorry, this is what we see down here. Does the output indicate that the carnival, carnival game was unfair? Explain your answer. Okay, so let me just slide this down a little so we can see what we had above. Now remember, up here when it said to state the proportion of twos that were spun, we got one out of 10, right? There was one, two out of 10 spins. And if we, I'm gonna write that as, if you did one divided by 10, it would give you 0.1 or 0 0.10. And the reason I'm writing it like this is because that's how they're writing it down here. So we could see 0.1 is right here, okay? And basically, I mean, that occurred a lot of times. That, that occurred, I would say, what, 20, over 20 times, okay? See, here's the 20. It looks like it occurred 21 times. I mean, you could count them if you want. So when they ask, does the output indicate the carnival game was unfair? No, no. Nope. Spinning one two out of 10 spins occurred quite frequently. It actually occurred over 10% of the time. And if you wanna look at spinning anything even more extreme than it, if you were to calculate all of these, it looks like that occurred, right? One, two, or even no twos, about 35% of the time if you added up these and these. But either way, I would just say no, it does not indicate that it was unfair because a spin of 0.10 occurred over 20% of the time. All right, so here we go. No, it did not indicate the carnival game was unfair because 0.10 occurred over 20% of the time, making it just a normal occurrence, right? If that's an expected outcome. All right, number 17. So it looks like this page itself deals with series and sequences. Okay, so a recursive formula for this sequence is, now remember, a recursive formula, I'm going to underline that, a recursive formula is where you define your first term, a sub 1 equals whatever it is, and then you make an a sub n formula to represent how you can find the next term and the term after that. So we can automatically eliminate choice 1 and 3 because those are not recursive formulas. These right here are explicit formulas. All right, so remember, a recursive formula actually has really two sentences, right? Like choice two and four. Okay, now let's figure out what's going on here. We could see that these numbers are going down. They're getting smaller. Now, choice two says that the first term is 64, which is true, 
and it says these numbers are going down by 16 to get from one term to the next. So you want to look and say, are we consistently going down by 16 to get from one term to the next? Well, 64 minus 16 is 48. 48 minus 16 is 32, not 36. Okay, so this is not our rule. We're not going down by 16 to get from one term to the next. All right, let's look at what choice four says. Choice four does say the first term is 64, which it is. And this is saying to get from one term to the next, we multiply the term we're on by 0.75. So try it out. Okay, 64 times 0.75 gives you 48. If we take 48 and multiply it by 0.75, we get 36. Okay, 36 times 0.75 it would keep going and keep going. So choice four is our answer. All right, number 18. A tree farm initially has 150 trees. Each year, 20% of the trees are cut down and 80 seedlings are planted. All right, now, I just wanna point something out. If you're cutting down, or if they're cutting down 20% of the trees, doesn't that mean that 80% of the trees remain, right? If 20% are cut down, that means that 80% remain. Okay, and then in addition to that, 80 seedlings are planted. So they're adding on 80 new seedlings. Okay, which recursive formula models the number of trees A sub n after n years? All right, now, um, we want to eliminate any, any of the choices that are not recursive. Okay, and remember, a recursive formula is going to have two separate sentences one that defines the first term, and one that defines what we could do to find the next term afterwards. So choice one and choice two are recursive. Choice three, if you see everything all in one equation like that, that is not recursive. So choice three and choice four are not recursive formulas, so we have to get rid of those. Okay, so let's think about what's happening here. We start off with 150 trees, so these both say the first term is 150. Now, basically what's happening is 80% of the trees remain, and then in addition to that, we're adding on 80 more. So we want to take, looks like this is choice two. If we want to find the next term, we take the previous term and multiply it by 0.8, or 80%, right? Because 80% of the last term remains. And then in addition to that, we're adding on 80 new seedlings. So choice two is what says that. Choice one, they were trying to trick you here, right? See that 0.2 doesn't mean 20%. And since they put 20% in the problem, they were trying to trick you. But 20% are lost. 80% remains. So the 80% is what's important to us. Okay, so number 19. A company fired several employees in order to save money. The amount of money the company saved per year over five years following the loss of employees is shown in the table below. Okay, so it says down here which expression determines the total amount of money saved by the company over five years. Now, whenever you want to find the total, right, the sum of a series, you can use, I'm looking at the answer choices, you can use one of two formulas, and I'm seeing choice one and two show the first formula, and choice three and four show the second formula. Okay, so the formula over here on the left is just the sum of a geometric series formula. And the sum over here on the, 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 the formula over here on the right, this is our summation symbol. And when we use this, we want to place our geometric explicit formula next to it. Now, I just want to point out, this is not always going to be a five. The only reason I put a five here is because they want it over five years. Okay, so let's see what happens. So basically, let me start with the formula over here on the left. The sum of the first five years, so I'm going to replace that n with a 5 because this is the number of terms. And now a sub 1 is our first term, which is 59,000. So let me replace that with 59,000. Okay, and then minus, I'm going to have to squeeze this. Again, we have a sub 1, so that's going to be 59,000. So I'm going to be writing over the table here. And then the r is what we're multiplying by to get from one term to the next. Now, you may not be able to just look and say, oh, this is what I'm multiplying by to get from one term to the next. So what we can do is, in our calculator, take a 
term and divide it by the term in front of it. Okay, so if you plug in your calculator, 64,900 divided by 59,000, it will wind up giving you 1.1. Okay, if we take this third term, 71,390, and divide it by the term in front of it, that'll also give us 1.1. So our R is going to be, let me extend this over, so I'm going into this 1.1. Okay, and then again, I see an N, so we know that's five because there's five terms. And then that's gonna be over one minus R, which we just said was 1.1. Okay, so now when you look at choice, actually choice one, look at this. This right here matches exactly with what we have. So choice one is going to be the answer. Now let me just go through why the, um, I mean, choice two doesn't match up because they used a, 0.1 instead of a 1.1. And then I just want to quickly show how this formula works because it could have been choice three or four. Okay, so using this formula, right, we want to take the sum of the first five terms. So we're starting at the first term and ending on the fifth. And basically, you're just going to plug your numbers into our geometric explicit formula. So the first term would be 59,000. We had already found the R to be 1.1. And that'll be to the n minus 1 power. Okay, so if you look here, neither one of these says exactly that. This one just says to the n power. And this one says 0.1 instead of 1.1. Okay, so these ones don't work either. Okay, number 20. It says the sum of the first 20 terms. Now, if they want us to find the sum, what we need to do is we need to use our geometric series formula. That lets you find the sum of the first however many terms you need. Okay, so we want to find the sum of the first 20 terms. So n stands for the number of terms. So we're going to replace the n with the 20. So s sub 20. Okay, now that's going to be equal to a sub 1 represents our first term. So our first term is negative 2. So negative 2 minus, and then I'm going to replace this with a negative 2. And remember, when you substitute a negative, always put it in parentheses. Okay, now the R. <clears throat> R stands what we're multiplying by to get from one term to the next. So you can clearly see we're multiplying by negative 3, right? Negative 2 times negative 3 is 6. 6 times negative 3 is negative 18. Negative 18 times negative 3 is positive 54. So our R is going to be negative 3 n to the n power. Now, we already said n is 20, right? If we replace this n with 20, we have to replace that n with a 20. And then in the denominator, it's going to be 1 minus, and again, r is the same thing it was here, negative 3. So let's put that negative 3 in a parenthesis. Okay, and then all you really have to do is just plug this entire thing into your calculator exactly like you see it. And I would even use alpha y equals. I would set up the fraction and plug this in exactly like you see it, parentheses and all. And when you do, you see that choice three is our answer. Number 21, there's actually no work to be done whatsoever. It's just knowing how the remainder theorem or the factor theorem works. If we know that p of three equals zero, okay, what that means is x equals positive 3 is a 0 of our function, then we know x minus 3 would be a factor. Right? Think about it. This is this example. This is just a separate example off to the side. If we have, let's say, x minus 3 and x plus 5 being a factor, right, being our factors, then wouldn't x equals positive 3 and x equals negative 5 be zeros? So, I mean, this right here, over here, has nothing to do with the problem. But basically, look, if x equals 3 is a 0 of our function, then isn't x minus 3 its factor? So choice 2 would be the answer. All right, so number 22. They give us f of x, and they first want us to figure out what f of one-half equals. So basically, we're just taking one-half and substituting it in for all the x's. Okay, so that's what I did off the side here. I replaced all the x's with one-halves. 
And when you determine what that's equal to, you wind up getting zero. Okay, so that was the first thing I wanted to do, figure out whether it equals zero or does not equal zero. So it does equal zero. So we can eliminate choices three and four. Okay, now they just want to know which is 2x plus 1 or is 2x minus 1 a factor? Now, if positive 1 half is a 0, right? x equals 1 half is a 0 of, one of, of our function, then basically the factor has to have a negative in it. So it's going to be choice 2. Okay, so since f of 1 half equals 0, then its factor is going to be 2x minus 1, not 2x plus 1. Now, again, that's just the factor theorem, um, the remainder theorem, really. And if you have trouble doing that, right, if you can't look at a 0 and come up with what factor corresponds with it, well, then what you really could do is just take this and factor it. All right, so let's do it. So if I were to factor this, I would... Well, first I would look and say, do I have a greatest common factor? Is there anything I can pull out of every single term? And there's not. So then I'm going to jump into grouping. Group together the first two terms and group together these last two terms. So out of the first two terms, it looks like I could pull out, what, an x cubed? Which would lead me with 2x minus 1 in parentheses, okay? Because... If I had 2x to the 4th and I took out 3 of those x's, don't I still have the 2 and still have 1 of those x's? So I bring down the 2x. And then I bring down the minus, and anything divided by itself is 1. Okay, so now out of these two terms, I could either pull out a positive 8 or a negative 8. But because I want to be left with the same thing in parentheses, I'm going to pull out a negative 8. Okay, and then negative 16x divided by negative 8 would be positive 2x. And then 8 divided by negative 8 would be negative 1. And these match up, which we wanted them to. So when that happens, we take what's in front of the common parentheses, so the x cubed minus 8, and we group them together. And then we take the 2x minus 1 and bring it down once and once only. So you could see, even if you took the time and factored it, isn't 2x minus 1 a factor? Okay, so choice 2 is the answer. All right, number 23, consider the function f of x, which statement is true? All right, so I'm just going to go through these one by one. Now, the first two talk about factors. So if you want, just factor this expression. Okay, so I'm first going to look and say, is there greatest common factors or anything I could pull out of all of these terms? And there's not. So I'm, I'm really going to factor this similar to how I did the one up here. I'm just going to group together the first two terms and group together the last two terms. All right, so what are these first two terms? What they have in common is an x squared. So when I pull out an x squared, well, 2x to the third divided by x squared is just 2x because if I take these two x's and pull them out of here, I still have this 2 and another x remaining. So I'm going to do 2x, and then I'm going to bring my plus sign down. And anything divided by itself, right, x squared divided by x squared is 1. And you have to put the 1 there. Okay, now out of these two terms, I'm going to pull out a negative 9. Okay, and then negative 18x divided by negative 9 is 2x, positive 2x. And then negative 9 divided by negative 9 is positive 1. Okay, and because these parentheses match up, we can take what's in front of them, the x squared minus 9, and we could group those together in a parenthesis, and then bring down the 2x plus 1, bring down that common parenthesis just once. Now, one thing I do want to point out, this is a difference of perfect squares. Okay, this is dots. We could factor that further. So we know that factors to x plus 3 times x minus 3, and then let's bring down the 2x plus 1. All right, so this is the fully factored form of our original expression. I just want to, um, this kind of, let me just rewrite that. That was kind of messy. Okay, so now, uh, let's go through the, through the answer choices. 2x minus 1 is a factor of f of x. Nope. All right, the next one. x minus 3 is a factor of f of x. It sure is. There it is. That's our answer. As far as the other answer choices go, all they wanted you to do was plug in positive 3 for the x's 
and negative one half for the x's, as well as down here, one half for the x's, and see which of these statements are true. Well, okay, I did that off the side here. I substitute, when I substituted three in for all the x's, this was equal to zero. When I substituted negative one half in for all the x's, this is equal to zero. These are both equal to zero, so choice three says these are not equivalent. That's false f of 3 equals 0, and f of negative 1 half equals 0. So this is false, so that's not our answer. And then choice 4 says f of 1 half equals 0. When I substituted in 1 half for all the x's, I got it to be equal to negative 17.5, not 0. So this one's false as well. So in number 24, uh, they give us f of x and g of x, and they want us to state the quotient and remainder of f of x divided by g of x in this form. All that's saying is when you divide, this is the quotient, plus you're going to have a remainder over what it was we were dividing by, which is g of x. Okay, so they're just telling us to do long division, and we are going to have a remainder. Okay, so we are taking this expression, f of x, and we're dividing it by x minus 4. All right, so how we do this is we look at the first term out here, which is x, and we say, well, what do I multiply this x by to give me 3x cubed. Well, I would multiply it by 3x squared. So I put this right on top up here. And then we're going to take this 3x squared and distribute it to both of these two terms down here. So 3x squared times x is 3x cubed. And then 3x squared times negative 4 is negative 12x squared. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to subtract this expression from the one above it. So to show we're subtracting, all we do is we change our signs. So this is going to become a negative, and then this negative right here becomes a positive, and we circle them to show that we're changing it. Okay, so then these first two terms cancel out, and negative 4x squared plus 12x squared is positive 8x squared. And since we have two terms out here, we want to have two terms down here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this next term and just bring it right down. And then we start the process again. We say, what do we multiply this x by to give us 8x squared? But we need to multiply it by 8x. So I'm going to put plus 8x up on the top here. And then we're going to distribute the 8x to both of these two terms. So 8x times x is 8x squared. And then 8x times negative 4 is negative 32x. And then to show that we are subtracting, we're going to change our sign. So this becomes a negative, and this becomes a positive. Okay, so our first two terms cancel. And then 2x plus 32x is 34x. And again, we're going to bring this next term down. <clears throat> All right, so it looks like this is the last time we're going to do it. So we say, what do we multiply x by to give us 34x? Positive 34. So I'm going to put a plus 34 up here. Oh, my pen's not working. There we go. And then we're going to distribute this 34 to both terms. So 34 times x is 34x. And then 34 times negative 4 is negative 136. All right, and then to show that we're subtracting, we're going to change our sign. So this becomes a negative, and this changes to a plus sign. Okay, so then our first two terms cancel off, and negative 1, here, this circle's kind of blocking that right there, plus 136 is 135. So this right here is our remainder. So how we write the remainder is, since it's a positive number, we write plus, and we're going to put the remainder over what we were dividing by right here. So we're left with 135 out of the x minus 4 we were dividing by. Okay, so this right here is the answer to the first part of the question, right? They wanted us to state the quotient, which is this, and the remainder, which is this, in this form, okay, which we did. Okay, now it says, is x equals 4 a root of f of x? Well, if x equals 4, 
is a root or a zero or a solution of f of x. What that means is if we were dividing by x minus 4, right, the factor that's associated with the zero, then we would have no remainder. But since we have a remainder, that tells us x equals 4 is not a root of f of x. All right, so there we have it. x equals 4 is not a root of f of x because there is a remainder when dividing f of x by x minus 4. All right, we are finally on to the very last page. It looks like we have all um, radicals and exponents on this page. Okay, so they want to know which expression is this equivalent to, okay? Which of these answer choices? Now, this was a little confusing to me. Like, I didn't know if this said a to the third or the cube root of this expression, but I was kind of looking over here and see where the three is, like just above where this radical sign starts. It's kind of in the same spot. So I'm assuming this says the cube root, okay? If it was a cubed times the square root of, I think there would be a little more space here. Okay, so again, that could have been kind of confusing. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this expression and get it out of radical form. So I'm gonna take this a and just bring it right down. And then the cubed root of two. Remember, if you wanna rewrite this using power over root, isn't the power on this two a one? Isn't this two to the first power? So if I did power over root, it would be two to the one third power. And same thing here, if I use power over root, the power on the b is a two, and the root is a three, so it'd be b to the two thirds power. Okay, so that's our first term. Now, in this right here, if we get this out of radical form, again, it's the cubed root of four to the first power. So since the power on the four is a one, if we do power over root, we could rewrite this as four to the one third power. And then again, power over root. So a to the two thirds power. And same thing with the b. That's supposed to be a three. Same thing with the b. If we do power over root, the power on this b is a one, so it'd be b to the one third power. All right, so let's see what we could do with this here. Now, first thing. Okay, if we wanna first look at the numbers, right? Two to the one third times four to the one third. Right? You can plug that in your calculator, right? And that is equal to two. So if you wanna do that in your calculator, you can, but let me explain why, because you're not always gonna be able to use a calculator. Um, all right, see this four, isn't four the same thing as two times two, right? Two times two is four. So if I wanna make all these bases the same, okay? This already has a base of a two, so I'm just gonna leave that as two to the one third. Okay, then times, like we said, this four can be rewritten as two times two, right? And then I'll bring down this one-third power. Okay, so basically we have two to the one-third times, and then I could take this exponent and put it on both of these terms inside the parentheses. So we have a two to the one-third and another two to the one-third. Okay, so basically this came down. We have two to the one-third, which is here, and another two to the one-third, which is here. And don't we know when we're multiplying terms with the same base, we keep the base and we add the exponent. So one-third plus one-third plus one-third is three-thirds. And isn't three-thirds the same thing as one? And isn't two to the first just two, right? So that's how the calculator calculated the answer and got two. Okay, now let's look at our a's. This right here is a to the first power, and this is a to the two-thirds power, right? So if we had a to the first times a to the two-thirds, don't we do the same thing? We keep the base and we add the exponents. Okay, so I'm gonna keep the base. And let me do this off the side. If you add one plus two-thirds, well, one is the same thing as one over one. So to find a common denominator, let's multiply top and bottom of this first fraction by three. Okay, so this would be three thirds plus two thirds. So three plus two is five, and you keep the denominator, so five thirds. 
Okay, so when we add these two exponents, we get 5 thirds. So this would be a to the 5 thirds. Let's do the same thing with the b's. Well, the b's, you could just visually do that, right? If you keep the base of b and you add the exponents 2 thirds plus 1 third, they already have a common denominator. It gives you 3 thirds. And 3 thirds just simplifies to 1. So this is b to the first power. Okay, now, if you look at the answer choices, they made it a little more difficult for us because other than choice 2, which these don't match up, okay, so we could automatically eliminate that one, um, the other answer choices are written with radicals. So we're going to have to take this fractional exponent and change it back into radical form. Now, if we think about this, okay, let me take the 2 and bring it down because that's just 2 to the first. Okay, if there's no exponent, if there's no fractional exponent, you know, you can't write it in radical form. So see this b? It's just b to the first. There's no fractional exponent. So I'm just going to bring the b down. But now if I take this and rewrite it using power over root, this is the cube root of a to the fifth power. Which, when you look through, I don't see that there. So I think what they did was they broke down this radical into simplest form. So I'm going to bring down the 2b, and I'm going to split this radical up into two separate radicals, like this. Okay, we're going to put our biggest perfect cube in this radical, and whatever's left over in this leftover radical. All right, so if we look at a to the fifth, basically as long as the exponent is a multiple of the root, so a multiple of 3, it's a perfect cube. So like a cubed, a to the sixth, a to the ninth. So the biggest perfect cube that you can pull out of an a to the fifth would be a to the third. Okay, again, its exponent has to be a multiple of whatever the root is. So it has to be a multiple of three. Now, if we pull three of these out and we had five of them, doesn't that mean there's two left to go in the second radical? Okay, and the reason we pull out a perfect cube is to get it out of the radical. Because think about it, the cube root of a cubed is just a. Right? And if you can't see that, think about our rule, power over root, 3 over 3. It would be a to the 3 over 3 power. And isn't 3 over 3 just 1? So it would be a to the first power. Okay, so this is equal to just a. So let me rewrite this in alphabetical order. We have 2 times a, and then bring down the b, and then I'll bring down the leftover radical, which is the cube root of a squared. All right, so that matches up with choice one. Now, honestly, that was a really difficult question. If, you know, you get stuck when you're doing a question like that on a test, all you have to do is, in your calculator, plug in the expression exactly like you see it, and plug in the answer choices exactly like you see them one by one, and see which answer choice gives you the same value as the original expression. The only thing I want to remind you is, if you're going to, you know, this is called like the cheat method in the calculator. If you're going to use this method, please make sure that your variables are not stored as zero or one because then multiple answers could check out, okay? Okay, so what I did was I stored A as two in my calculator and B as three. You could pick whatever numbers you want. Again, I just wouldn't pick zero or one because then a lot of times more than one answer will check out and I plug the original question in my calculator, right, exactly like I saw it, except the calculator does cal capital letters. And then when I plugged in choice one, exactly like I saw it, look at that, these two values matched up. If I were to plug in any of the other answer choices, it wouldn't give me this 19 point whatever. Okay, so you can always, you know, have the calculator to help out if you're really stuck. Okay, so number 26, they wanna know if this expression is equivalent to which of the following? Okay, well, these are in radical form and these are not. So let's first get them out of radical form. So I'm going to put, I'm going to just go through and any term that doesn't have a power on it, I'm going to put a power of one just so we see its power. Okay, so we have three to the first x squared y to the first under this square root. And technically if there's no number where the root is, we know that that's always going to be a two. Okay, so if we use our rule power over root, right? Three to the first power under a square root. So power over root, we could, we could rewrite this as three to the one half power. Okay, so then same thing. We have two squared under a square root. So if we do power over root, 
that's going to be x to the 2 over 2 power, which we know is going to simplify to 1, right? And then here, I'm going to just do that now. Let me just make that x to the first. Okay, and then again, power over root, 1 over 2. So this is going to be y to the 1 half power. Okay, now times, let's do the same thing with this radical. So the 27 has a power of a 1 on it. One on it, excuse me. So if we do power over root, that'll be 1 over 3. So 27 to the 1 third power. All right, and then same thing here. X to the 3 over 3 power. Okay, power over root. And we know 3 divided by 3 is just 1, so let's just again write that as X to the first. And then power over root, 2 over 3. So Y to the 2 thirds power. All right, and then we can just figure out what this is all equal to. Now, if you were to just take these two numbers, right, 3 to the 1 half times 27 to the 1 third and just plug it in your calculator, um, it wouldn't give you a nice clean answer like it did in the last one. And the reason why is, um, I mean, if you look at this, right, 3 to the 1 half power, if you plug that in your calculator, it's going to give you an ugly answer. If you take 27 to the 1 third and plug that in your calculator, it's just equal to 3 because if we did... If we look up here, right, power over root, if you think about this, the cube, let's go back to here, the cube root of 27. So I probably should have just done that from the beginning. The cube root of 27, it just means what could you multiply by itself three times to give you 27? Well, three, right? Isn't three times three times three? 27. So if you were to plug this in your calculator, it would just give you three. All right, you know what, let me do this just to save some space. I'm going to, should have done that from the beginning. I'm going to erase this and just make it a three. Three to the first. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to multiply this expression, this first expression, by the second expression. So let's take the look at the numbers now. Now, if you're multiplying two terms with the same base, we keep the base and we add these exponents. So one plus one half is one and one half, or three halves, okay? If you wanna do it off to the side, one half plus one over one, you can find a common denominator. Oop. And basically you have one half plus two halves. So one plus two is three, and you keep the denominator. So this is equal to three halves. Okay, so that's gonna be our exponent on the three. All right, now with the x's, x to the first, times x to the first is just x to the second. You keep the base and you add the exponents. And then y to the one half times y to the two thirds, where we keep the base and we add the exponents. So off to the side, if I do one half plus two thirds, let's find a common denominator. So the common denominator is going to be six. To get this first fraction, to have a denominator of six, we have to multiply top and bottom by three. And to have the second fraction have a denominator of 6, we have to multiply top and bottom by 2. So really what we have is 3 over 6 plus 4 over 6. So isn't 3 plus 4 just 7? And we keep it over the common denominator. All right, let me just look and see. Actually, look at this. Choice 4 says this is the exact thing, okay? See how this matches with that? Choice four is our answer. And again, if you prefer to use that calculator trick, right, what you could do is you could plug in this original expression into your calculator and hit enter, and plug in the answer choices one by one and hit enter and see what matches up. All right, and here we go, number 27. So they give us really two sides of an equation, right, the left side and the right side, and they want us to figure out the value of A in order for these two sides to be equal. Okay, so let's first take this left-hand side of the equation out of radical form, okay? So, you know, this is the cube root of 81 to the first power. So if we do power over root, we could rewrite that as 81 to the one-third power, okay? And if we do power over root, 15 over three, isn't 15 divided by three just five? So that'll be x to the fifth power. And then same thing here with the y. So if we do power over root, 9 over 3. 9 divided by 3 is 3, so it would not just be y to the third. Okay, and then let's just bring down the right-hand side of the equation. 
Okay, well, look at this. What you'll notice here is that don't we have an x to the fifth and a y to the third on both sides? So you can just cancel those out. Basically, if you were to divide both sides of the equation by x to the fifth, y to the th um, third, they would just cancel out. So we're left with here 81 to the one-third power equals 3 to the a power. So we're trying to figure out what does a equal. Now, you should recognize that 81 can be rewritten with a base of 3, right? Because isn't 3 times 3, 9, and 9 times 9, 81? So this can be rewritten with a base of 3. Now let's think about it. 3 to what power would give us 81? Well, 3 times 3 is 9, times another 3 is 27, times another 3 is 81. So basically, 3 to the 4th power is equal to... 81. So I'm going to rewrite this as 3 to the 4th power and bring down this exponent of 1 third. And I'm also going to bring the right-hand side of the equation down. Now the reason I did this is so that I could get these bases to be the same. If these bases are the same, then aren't our exponents the same as well, right? These exponents have to be equal to each other. Now think about it. When you have a power raised to another power, don't we multiply these? So this is really 3 to the 4 thirds power. And on this side, I'm just going to bring down the 3 to the a power. So since both of our aces, I'm sorry, uh, bases are 3, these exponents have to be the same. So you could see that a has to be equal to 4 thirds. And there we have it.